Pilgrims, today we have the grace of speaking with artist Jaime Dominguez, who is the designer of the logo we are using for our virtual pilgrimage of freedom. He is an artist and an architect from Mexico City and has been doing contemporary artwork, sacred artwork for decades. And so it's really a pleasure for us to welcome him to our program. Hi there, everyone. I will try this better in Spanish to explain <laughs> better my, my artwork, okay? Wonderful. So what we'll do is we'll ask you some questions in English and you can go ahead and answer in Spanish and you'll have the translation Perfect. for us. Wonderful. Let's so um, if we look, yes. Well, I, I have seen many of your different pieces of artwork as well as the logo and they have a very particular style. It's almost like, almost like watercolor and I don't know if it's oil or acrylic, but can you tell us a little bit about your artistic style and also who you've worked with, who inspired you in your artwork? Sí, Catherine. Eh, eh, yo comencé I began a my painting, well, in, in sacred painting in 1988. So when I was in a congress in Rome at the end of the 90s, there was an art critic, a really important one. He was a Jesuit named um, Father Juan Plazola, he defined our work as Neo-Byzantine work. So this is how you call our style of artwork. It's inspired in Byzantine icons. There's like a simple drawing design. So if you look at the paintings, they also look like a mosaic uh, or like a stained glass window. So you bring those three together. So Father Juan, the Jesuit, defined us as Neo-Byzantines. So who? Fra Gabriel, who was a monk, and uh, myself. He was my teacher, my master. So these are the characteristics that we have. They're very colorful. One of the main things is that they're colorful. And we're able to do this because we use acrylic paint over canvas. So acrylic, uh, you can make it very light colored, almost transparent, almost like watercolor. And then you can also make it very thick. So you've got this, you know, the whole different, you know, from very light to very thick. So certainly this isn't a new technique, but it became very common in the pop art time in the 1960s, especially in the U.S. And so what we use for our acrylics is Liquitex. And that actually guarantees that the color doesn't fade out over time. And so we wanted to make sure that the artwork, especially contemporary artwork, maintained its freshness. And this is why we chose to do our works in acrylic and not oil. As you might know, oil work, because of the varnish that it has and the technique that you use, um, the colors become like yellow or green over time. And then the texture of these paintings actually start to crack. So to avoid this appearance of like old or antique uh, classic artwork, uh, we actually chose this other technique. Fresh work, I mean, excuse me, fresh and brilliant colors and the ability to maintain its contemporary look. And that is something that we did, that we started doing at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. So that's our style, and it's called Neo-Byzantine. Wonderful. Now, um, did you meet um, the friar? Where did you meet him? I understand he is in uh, the monastery at Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. Is that correct? Or was? Yes, I think correct. yes, I met him at the Abbey of Tepeyac at the Lake of Guadalupe. And so Fra Gabriel, he died actually in December, on the 17th of December. Um, he was 93 years old. And I was able to visit him just a week beforehand. And of course, he was very ready to, to meet the Lord, to go to the house of the Father. So the conversations that uh, he was having, you know, were all based on eternal life. And really, the legacy that he's left to each one of us. 
is un capítulo más. So personally, he is not just a good friend, but also a really important chapter or person in contemporary artwork. And so at the end of the 20th century, especially the last 20 years of the 20th century, we have some of the most important persons. We've got the Japanese artists like Yoi Washita. You also have Guatanave. And you also have the German artists, Brazilian artists like Claudio Pastro. And currently, we have a lot of Ukrainian artists of this genre. So there's almost 500 original pieces of artwork. And with those pieces of artwork, we're looking for an institution that might want to have this collection of contemporary sacred artwork. If you look at the Vatican uh, museums, you actually have a lot of that artwork there. It used to be, I think it was the second largest collection in the world, and now there's a lot of different collections of religious sacred artwork or sacred artwork, contemporary religious artwork. And so this collection is completely available for any institution, but we're a collection of different artists that come from around the world. And so we're on this timeline, right? The last 25 years of the 20th century. And that also includes the you know first three or four decades of this century, of course, depending on how long our Lord gives us life. So, so what do we want to give witness to? Wonderful. Well, we wanted to express through artwork um, the Word of God. We want to bring it to the whole world. Our artwork is very catechetic. Yeah, and children actually receive it very, very well because it's very colorful, you know, because it's a very simple drawing and things like that. And because of that, some people do criticize us. They're like, hey, come on, your paintings actually seem like cartoon strips. And he's like, well, yeah. Um, this is the reason why, because we want children to see it, be interested in it, receive it, and learn from it. Well, I know um, we actually, a piece of artwork that we have in our home uh, is from you, and it's one that I really like. A lot of adults also really like it. It's the prodigal son. And so you have that gospel passage very well um represented in that painting, as well as a circular painting of the Holy Family. It has the colors, I think, actually, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So it's neat to know that you actually also worked in the modern basilica, if I'm not mistaken. See, Yes, the first painting that you're referring to called The Prodigal Son. Well, we work always from the sacred scripture. We try to be very faithful to the contents of the gospel of the Old Testament. So we want every piece of artwork, every painting to be a meditation. And so when you look at this painting, you can say, oh, I'm reading the gospel. It's represented here. And you can find in these paintings different symbols that come from the scriptures. A lot of symbols are explained in the gospels. So think about the prodigal son. It's called the return of that prodigal son. What I personally like is how the, the father embraces him. And certainly how the prodigal son kneels down before the father because he realized he made a mistake. So you can see it here. There's yes, the painting. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. See? Uh huh. And then you have the older brother also. In the and background. yes, we have the other brother with whom, I mean, we, a lot of us identify with, right? Because we can say, oh, yeah, I've been the prodigal son or something in some moment in my life. But, you know, the older brother, I think all of us in a lot of moments in our life were this older brother. Like, we see this and we don't like that the father um, forgives and rewards the sinner or um, repents and stays at the house. And so the one who's actually in the house uh, is just angry in a way. And so I think this is a painting which helps us to meditate more on when we're the prodigal son, when we're the older brother. Of course, you know, looking at it, we see that the father is always merciful and loving. And so we always have to go back to his house to be forgiven. So this decision, this uh, this way back is important so that we can come back and encounter this merciful Father. 
porque mucha, muchas personas right. there's a lot of people that decide that they'll stay eating with the pigs as they say right and they say oh we can never be forgiven but he's like oh no not at all we have to leave this this life of the pigs behind and get back on the right path and ask forgiveness and allow the mercy of God to work inside of us so it's a beautiful painting that you chose it's a beautiful passage and this other one is an allegory of the Holy Family. It certainly doesn't come from the gospel itself, but it does speak to the Holy Family. So, of course, who you have is Our Lady, who is embracing the child together with Joseph, and you can see it here. Mm -hmm. So, together with Joseph, the two of them are walking, right? So... And the child has the Gospels open in front of him. So it's a very Guadalupan, you could say, painting. And it's uh, in the Church of the Capuchinas, the female Capuchins, next to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And if you look in those, those, those buildings, it's filled with paintings of my master, uh, Fra, the, the friar who taught me. You have... Another one which I love, which is San Saint uh, Juan Diego, which is not very um, well known, but I would recommend that you go and see it. It's just beautiful. And I'll just make sure also, if you want to look on the um, the link that I'm going to send you, you'll see the rest of his painting. So hopefully we can get that to your viewers. So where does it come from? Well, it was donated by a German bishop. It's a very interesting story. And it's because, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe, she listens to the prayers of people from all over the world. And so for this German bishop, he made, or she, listened to his prayer. And so in 1998, uh, just as we're, you know, getting close to the second, uh, the millennium, he, go, he goes to Our Lady of Guadalupe Basilica and says to the abbot, <coughs> He says, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe listened to my prayer and there was a miracle that happened and I would like to, you know, give thanks to God for something, to give something. And the abbot said, okay, well, I would like you to pay, to be the patron of this money, of this, excuse me, of this painting. And so the German bishop helped to pay for the painting. And other donors actually helped to pay for the painting who wanted to participate in this work. And you can see their names on, you know, the edge of the painting, all of those who helped in some way. Uh, were there. So anyway, you can see it, and there's a lot of modern work there. And so I want to explain what we do is not always, you know, drawing things by hand. We used to, and you can, but now we use a big scanner and a computer to make the original drawing. And we do this because we want to make it quickly and very cleanly, clean lines. And so you see on this painting, you're not going to see like the um, the drawing underneath the paint, but you've got, you know, the little lines that were put there from a scanner. And then we filled all those lines up with painting. And so we, we made a plan to do this painting in five years, but because of the new technique, we were able to do it in six months. Oh my goodness, wow, that's incredible. So this work in, a, in, in Our Lady of Guadalupe Basilica, it, they say. You have to guarantee uh, for 500 years, okay? Oh. <laughs> I don't care. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> so, he says, I'll guarantee you. I'll guarantee you. It'll last for 500 years. I'm not going to be here, but but that's why we chose the particular materials that we did, right? And so if you look at the colonial paintings that are there, they're about 500 years old and they're kind of, you know, we decided to use the same materials, Holland, or excuse me, Dutch linen or um, canvas. So that, you know, all insects and millers get in there and they'll eat the canvases. And then we also used a, a particular type of acrylic, which is Liquitex. And they actually said that they can guarantee the color for centuries. So the pigment will last for at least 500 years and more, they say. So we were able to guarantee it. <laughs> so that's why the abbot gave us this work to paint. So the design is from Fra Gabriel, and then the rest of the painting is actually mine. De acuerdo. Este, así es la historia well, if, de. Uh, well, if, if any of our pilgrims, um, some of them actually 
have been to Mexico to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, or many might go, so maybe they'll have a chance to see um, something of not only uh, your your master painter, but also some of your work. That would be wonderful. But we do have your work here in our logo for the pilgrimage. And I know that you had a conversation with uh, Father Juan Solana here in Magdala. And so could you tell us a little bit of, you know, the elements that you chose for that particular logo, the round logo that we're using for our pilgrimage of freedom? Yes. Okay. Let's look at the logo. And so we're thinking about Exodus. Of course, it's an entire book of the Bible, right? But if you're going, you know, through the desert, you're going to go um, through the Red Sea, all this. I mean, these are books of the Bible that are so full of symbols and moments, important moments. So, I mean, you could fill an entire chapel with all of these paintings that try to express this, you know, lots of paintings for each moment. So we had to choose just a few important elements. For us, as we looked at this logo, uh, we were thinking, okay, what would be good? Well, the most important one is is God the Father. Shema Israel, listen to him, you know, the burning bush, who is the sign of God the Father. And then, of course, we have the sandals, right? The sandals of Moses, because we have to be humble before the Lord God. And so um, God asks Moses to take off his sandals because he's stepping on holy ground. So it's really important for those sandals to be there and, you know, in front of the burning bush. So that's God the Father who's right there. So he's the beginning. He's the one who gives the mission to Moses uh, so that he can bring the chosen people out of Egypt. Right? It's, it's the whole moment. It's the moment of the call when he's saying, you know, I hear, I hear the people calling out to me, and now I'm calling you. So yes, that's, that's wonderful. What else do we see there? Uh -huh. So as you go out of Egypt, of course, there's something else which is implied, right? We have to cross. We have to renounce. We have to renounce something in our life and leave it behind uh, so that we can go into the promised land. And so... This um, crossing the Red Sea is extremely important. Leaving this old life behind, maybe this life that was very far away from the Father, just like the prodigal son, maybe it was a life of sin. Maybe it's a time when we would adore other gods, like the Hebrews. They were very contaminated, you know, in Egypt, adoring all these weird gods like that looked like dogs or like falcons or whatever, so... So they became sort of sort of um, polytheistic. So they had to, you know, get this mix of this Egyptian religion uh, out of their system that was mixed in with their monotheistic religion. So going out was important. So what is that moment when the chosen people leaves their life behind and they take the promise on, which is the promised land, the land he promised to Abraham. The land he promised to Isaac and Jacob and all the rest, right? So that moment, of course, is crossing the Red Sea. So it had to come in the main part of the logo. So you see the hand of Moses right in the middle, raising his staff, separating those waters. You can see how the waters are separating. And so what's behind? The old life, as we said. The old man is left behind. And before us is the promised land. And so Moses is this instrument of God, rising that staff into the air and dividing that sea in two so that the people behind him can pass through. And they can all take a hold of this promise. And they can begin to live this promise. But then they enter into the desert, right? So <laughs> in the desert, the chosen people begin to receive blessings, as well as passing through a lot of tests. And these tests make them doubt. Sometimes they want to go back to the life, their old life in Egypt. Of course, there's a lot of complaints of the chosen people to Moses. Why did you bring us here to this terrible place to die in the desert? And remember, that's what they said. I mean, we had our onions and all those, the meat pots and all that great work. I mean, even if we were slaves, we were good, weren't we? And you've taken us into this terrible desert. So in this desert implies renunciation, um, suffering, but also graces of God. 
So the most important, you know, wasn't the manna. It wasn't necessarily the serpent that cured them from being bitten by other serpents. Not even, you know, the quails that came down over the camp at night to give them meat, you know, like Lord gave them. The most important, obviously, is the Ten Commandments, the tablets. Yeah, they're right in front, right on the, it's almost the very first thing that you see, the burning bush and then the uh, the Ten Commandments, right? So this is what made the people of Israel understand what their new life would be. You're going to follow these commandments, you know, the first um, commandment, the very first commandment, listen to the Father, He is your God. And this actually helps them to remember that they are a monotheistic people, and they're going to worship one only God. And then you can go through the next nine. Of course, the first is the most important for their identities. So, just like for Christians, right? You know, there's a lot of different types of Christians, Orthodox, Copts, Anglicans, Lutherans, Catholics, and all of us, right? What unifies us? Jesus Christ himself. So that's what brings us together. We're all Christian because we all believe in Jesus. Now think about the Jews. Seems like they're more divided than even we are. There's Orthodox, or ultra-Orthodox, there's Sephardis. There's Messianic Jews. There's tons of different types of divisions or different groups within Judaism. So what is it that brings them together? The very first commandment, the essence of their religion. You will adore only one God, your God, Adonai, God of mercy, the God of goodness. In this time, the people didn't talk about Elohim, who is the God of you know, justice, but rather Adonai, who is the God of mercy. So obviously, this element, these commandments, had to be right in the center of the logo because it's so important for the chosen people. So they could walk with the Ten Commandments. And remember, you know, Moses gets mad and he breaks them at one point. So he has to go up to the mountain another time so that God writes them out again. And remember, it's what they kept in the Ark of the Covenant. So the commandments... Uh, they kept some manna in there and the staff of Aaron that, that flowered, right? The staff of the uh, the priestly class. So those were the three things within the Ark of the Covenant. So these elements had to be there. This element had to be there, right? So even if, if Moses <laughs> broke them, the Father gave them back to, to the people. So that's why it had to be in this logo. So... We have to remember as pilgrims, right? We have to be sure that we're before God's presence with humility, like Moses. We have to leave behind this life of imperfection and, and sin behind us. And then we have to cross the, the Red Sea to go to this new life, this promised land. And it's not just to obey the Ten Commandments when we come in to make a new life. But we have the commandments, we have the sacraments, we have the Word of God, you know, the Bible. So during this pilgrimage of Exodus, reading the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, the Bible, and trying to live our life during this Lenten time with the sacraments, you know, really close to the Lord. And I would recommend especially, you know, penance, reconciliation, the Eucharist. I would just recommend to everybody to be close to the sacraments. So I think this is what the logo brings together. It's wonderful. I mean, I think it's a perfect summary of uh, what the pilgrimage really looks to be. You know, these 40 years in the desert are 40 days of Lent. And we have, you know, this pilgrim staff. We're going, we're listening to a call, knowing that the Lord is listening. We're going out to be able to enter into his covenant. So thank you so much for, for doing this, for participating in our virtual pilgrimage with all of your artistic talents and certainly the depth of your own spiritual life. And as the, uh, the, you know, the iconists from the past and certainly the new artists that are based on the, on the Neo-Byzantines, as you said, really, it comes from prayer. I think your artwork certainly comes from, uh, from a deep spiritual life a relationship with the Lord. And that's what we're all looking for. So thank you so much for your example. And we are going to place down below in the comments and share with our pilgrims 
not only how they can find your book, but um, the images of some of your artwork and where they can find out more information. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Kathleen, thank you very much to you all. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Oh, we do. Thank you. All right. God bless you. God bless you too.